Welcome to the Rise of the Challenge podcast. Join me today. She's a radio and show business personality, an author, a transformational coach, and a motivational speaker. It's Robin Cote. How are you doing today, Robin? I'm doing wonderful. How about you? I'm doing good. I'm excited to have you on the show and talk about your Rise to the Challenge. First thing we like to do with all of our guests as we go straight to the beginning, talk about where you're from and what were you involved in growing up? Well, I'm originally from Miami, Florida, but dad, you know, after a bad marriage and got remarried, he took us all the way across the country to beautiful Arizona. So I'm pretty much a desert rat. I grew up here in Arizona. And the crazy thing is I've always had this drive to do something entertainment wise. So from a very young age, like 11, I just got involved in the movie industry and started working as an extra in movies that were being filmed here. And I also got a little nosy and went across the street from my school. There was a radio station. So even at 11, I was bugging the radio personalities to get on the radio station with them because I was so fascinated by it. And lo and behold, here I am 32 and a half years later, I've had a very interesting career. I wouldn't say, you know, I call it somewhat successful. But a lot of times, and, and it's going to sound sexist by me saying that, but a lot of times women are kind of held back in certain industries and you're always competing for that space. But I've maintained the longevity because no matter what anybody has said to me, I've managed to just keep going and going and going and I never give up. I've had that internal fire that just says, oh, you're going to tell me no? Uh-uh, sorry, that doesn't fly with me. I'm going to keep going until I get a yes, because as many times as you're told no, there's going to be somebody that says yes to you. And the secret to it is just to continue going and going and not giving up. If you have that dream, that inner fire, that's what keeps you going. And being that I started when I was so young, I kind of am surprised when I look at myself because everyone says, oh, no, you're." I turned 53 this week. So to look at that and go, wow, you know, you've had a lot of things happen in your life and not everything has been great. Not everything has been terrific. I've gone through so many different things in my life and I don't know if you want me to go into that. Yeah, we'll definitely, wanna... we'll definitely be talking about those things. Okay. So what, what else would you like me to tell you? Because I, I have just a treasure trove of things that I've been through that people will look at me now and they find it kind of odd that I've had the history that I have and that I'm able to keep doing things. Because, you know, we're faced with challenges in life every single day. And I faced a lot of challenges and adversity when I was much younger. And I didn't know at the time that I could give up. Because I had things that were relying upon me not giving up. So, you know, when you look back at where I've been and what I've been through and where I'm at now, it's just all part of a learning and growing process and allowing yourself to live in that moment of what's happening, but to never allow what's happened to you to formulate the rest of your life. You take that and you build on it and you just become that better, stronger version of yourself. You and I were talking before the show about the Phoenix. I've always felt like I'm a human Phoenix because I have burned down so many times through the years and have risen from the ashes because I feel like I don't have a choice. It's, you know, you either fall down and stay down or you push yourself and get back up because no one's going to do that for you. You're the only person that can. I think you hit a good point is a lot of people use their past and the stuff that they've gone through and they kind of use that and it kind of takes them in a direction that it, they don't want to go in. And I've always been taught where you kind of use those past things and kind of make it motivate you to keep on going and strive forward, challenge yourself in a way. And you mentioned it talking about earlier where about making sure that you go for those yeses and not let the no stop you. A lot of times in my profession, I've heard nine out of 10 people are going to say no to you, but it only takes that one person to say yes, where it keeps you motivated, keeps you going forward. So that's like something I always live by is keep going forward and always like a Phoenix rise to the challenge in a way. You mentioned about your uh, passion for the in, uh, film and music industry, radio industry. Was there anyone that you kind of looked up to that motivated you or inspired you to be involved in those things? Um, 
Well, I've had some mentors in my time that were local DJs that, you know, it was funny because back in the day, I would always just insert myself. I, I don't like to admit this a lot, but I ditched a lot of my senior year to go hang out at a radio station. And they kind of took me under their wing. And a lot of the male DJs, you know, you got a cute teenage girl. I was a lot cuter back then, but you know, cute teenage girl in the studio. And I would look at them and go, hey, I'm not here for that. I want you to teach me what you're doing. Because I was so fascinated by the formatics of everything. Because you think the DJ is just talking on a microphone and playing music, but there's so much more to it. So when I was much younger, I had people like that in my life who, as soon as they realized that I was like an understudy and not so much as a, a girl with a teenage crush, they were really good to me. And they would teach me those kinds of things. Um, they're still in my life today, which is really amazing. Um, some of them have already retired. And uh, one of them is Dennis McBroom. He was one of my, my wonderful friends that took good care of me when I was a teenager showing me things. And you won't recognize that name because that's an Arizona DJ that was well known here. And one of the people who I interned under years ago um, became a huge broadcast legend here. And what's funny is he's now the owner of the studio that I work for, that I've been working for for the past three years as a podcast producer. And his name is Dave Pratt. And you know, you see these people that stick around for a long time, they give so much of themselves and that's kind of where I learned. Those were my heroes that just stuck with it no matter what happened. And as far as real life heroes, I look at people that are going through things very challenging. I don't put sports figures up on a pedestal. I don't put actors up on a pedestal. I have worked my entire life in the film and the radio and the music industry. And I've run into so many wonderful people, but of course I've run into a bunch of not so wonderful people too. And you kind of just take the good from the good and you learn from the bad. But I think overall, some of my real life heroes are the people that are in my group now. And I have a, I have a little insignia, I call it the collective, hashtag the collective. And they're just good friends. Even some of them came into my life just a few years ago as I was evolving and changing and drawing different energies to me. Because I'm sure you understand what that's all about. We tend to draw the certain energies to us that we need at a certain time to learn things. And then sometimes those people move out of our circle and more people come in that not only rise up to the challenge of showing us how incredible transformation can be for them, but to teach us what we're made of and to show us that, hey, you know, by being around me, you can better yourself. And by me being around you, I can better myself. And I have a whole slew of those people right now that are in my close life. Um, Darren Birch is one of my dearest friends. I call him an angel on earth because he does so many things for people. He's a retired police officer, but he is somebody that I call an angel on earth because he will go above and beyond just to help people. And, you know, I have another friend, Kirk Nurmi. He gained notoriety for being a defense attorney for a killer years ago, but he gave up the law because he ran into some trouble with that person. And he's just one of my dearest friends and what I love most about him, he will hold me accountable and he'll call me out if I, because I have to rise above that human side of me and shine my light brighter and not go back into that human side and allow things to affect me and not put out anything negative. And if anything I put out there comes across like that, Kirk will always text me and say, hey, uh, you might want to rethink that. And that's what I adore about him the most because he will call me out on my stuff and I will pay attention because I have to be better than that. And I can't allow that human side to eke in and, and destroy all the hard work that I've done. You talked about being a female and being at a young age with those DJs. Did you feel that they kind of respected you a lot more because you weren't gonna, good, bring yourself down to a low level, but you're saying I'm better than this and I'm here for a purpose. And they could tell that you were there because you loved that industry. I would agree that they, they have respect for me because the fact that we've been friends for all these years, that shows me something. And 
I, I will even go a little further and, and tell you about an incident that happened. I don't know if you're familiar with who Stephen Piercy is. He okay. used to be the singer for Rat. Okay. So if you see the, you see the commercials lately for the insurance company where Rat's there, that's Stephen. Uh, when I was a teenager working in radio, I interviewed them and he was flirting with me. Like, you know, they all do. That's kind of the way musicians are. I love them to death. They're great. And I told him, I said, sweetheart, I said, I, I think you're just the nicest guy in the world, but you know, I got to tell you something. I don't mess with rock stars. I don't, I don't sleep around like that. I said, I, I have a little bit, you know, I'm here for the, the love of the music. And what's funny is many, many years later, I ran into him again. And this time he was fronting a band with the drummer from Cinderella, Fred Curry, a band called Arcade. And when I went to interview them, he said, hey, you're rock and rub and you used to work for this particular radio station, right? I'm like, how on earth would you remember that? <laughs> he goes, he said to me, he goes, because you're one of the women who said you wouldn't sleep with me because I was a rock star. He goes, I remember the women that say no more than I do the ones that say yes. So to have that 20 year gap of talking to him and for him to say that to me, I took that as a compliment because then there's a certain mutual respect because in this industry, you know, I'm not a perfect person. I've made mistakes. I've done things like everyone else has. But in this industry, being a woman is a little difficult. And I think because I grew up into it so young and being around all the male musicians that I worked with, I was able to develop this ability to communicate with men that I don't want to say intimidated them, but I could joke with my double meanings and it was like almost an intimidation factor because then they're like, oh gosh, I'm not gonna get anywhere with her. I'm not gonna mess with her because she's gonna have my number. So I, I think just the fact that I had that passion and that love for it, I've gained the respect because I didn't sleep my way through the business like some people can. I wanted to be able to have a career because in radio, oh my gosh, I don't know if you know the history of radio, but you could be coworkers at one station and then, you know, there's, there's no real job security. Then you could go to another radio station and that coworker that you might've had that little tryst with, he's going to be your boss or she's going to be your boss at the next radio station. So I've always had this little credo. I don't get my meat where I make my bread. So that's my general rule. I try to keep it separate, but yeah, I do believe through the years that I have gained that respect because they still talk to me and we're still friends. And if it had been the other way, I probably would have been a flash in the pan to them. That's crazy that saying the word, because usually it's like the opposite. Like they remember like the worst things that happened, but that <laughs> saying that word no played such a big impact. And 20 years later, he remembered that. And I know it, it kind of just shows like the whole, the kind of the reverse side of society and how people don't think of it that way. It's like, right. oh, you were with that person, and now that's a negative. We don't talk about the people who stick up for themselves in a way and kind of just do what society doesn't want us to do. Yeah, I just, I wasn't even interested in that. And, you know, most of these guys in radio and some women too, we do have a face for radio. We're not always the most attractive people in the world. Let me tell you that, but no, I'm just kidding. But the whole idea is just, I wanted to have fun and I wanted to learn. And some of these people were the best. And, you know, I've, I've got so many stories aboard tour buses that are so funny because a lot of times when you're going on board of a tour bus for a band, you know, they're thinking something else, but here I am with my press passes around my neck, bringing my photographer with me. It's like, nah, 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 nah. none of that's going to fly with me. I was just interested in meeting people. I was interested in, in learning everything I could about things. And probably the best experiences I've ever had has been working with local bands because you get to go inside the rehearsal houses, you get to see a song born. So it gives you a whole different level of appreciation for it. And they view you as one of the guys. They don't look at you like you're, you know, a, a groupie. Mm -hmm. And I used to get in trouble working for the music publication because I was second in line from the editor and he used to get mad at me. Hey, I don't want my, my assistant out there helping bands put equipment in, into the bars. What are you doing? 
you're not supposed to be playing a roadie. I'm like, dude, what am I, st I'm just standing around. Why can't I help? But I never understood that concept of being on a different level from anybody because we were all doing what we love to do. And, and together it was a team, no matter what, you know, it was never about me getting anything or them getting anything. It was just coming together, doing something fantastic because creative people are awesome people to hang around. There's so much energy. There's so much passion and creativity. And when you see people, especially live music, music is the one thing that brings everybody together. I don't care what language you are. I don't care where you're from. I don't care what sex you are. I don't care what orientation you are. I don't care what your background is. Music is a definitive thing that brings everybody together. And that was one thing I always loved about radio, playing music is the listeners calling, getting feedback getting to know who they were. I didn't just take their requests and hang up. I, I had party lines going on sometimes talking to listeners all night on the overnight shifts because these are people. These are people. They're no different than me. They're, they're just doing a different job than I'm doing. And that's, I, I just really have a love for this industry because it's fascinating to me how everything gets brought together with music, with film, with radio, with anything. It's such a powerful, powerful medium for people to come together. Did you know that you wanted to pursue the radio industry even more, maybe through college or for the more experience that you were getting at the station? <laughs> uh, well, actually, I started out when I was seven years old, sneaking in my brother's room, talking on his CB radio to all the truckers and people. <laughs> so I, I knew from the age of four, I wanted to be a DJ. Don't ask me how I knew that. Um, we had these little play school record players and they had uh, a, a microphone with a curly Q cord attached to it. And there was like plastic records. And one day I remember locking myself in the bathroom and playing this. My mom's knocking on the door and she picks the lock on the door and she says, you don't have to lock yourself in the bathroom to sing to your records. I said, mom, I'm not singing to my records. I'm playing DJ. So I have no idea where that came from, but at the age of four, that's what happened. And that is a memory that sticks out to me. So, you know, ditching high school, part of my senior year, I don't recommend it guys, get your education, get that under your belt. Don't do what I did. I had to go a little backwards, but you know, I always had a fascination to see what was going on. And I didn't even have to go to college, but I eventually did go to college and get my degree. And what's funny, I joke with everybody that college didn't teach me anything that I already didn't know. And all it did was get me a few boyfriends, <laughs> so, you know, cause I got, I got divorced a few months before I went back to school to get my degree in broadcasting. And I just laughed because everything they were teaching me, I excelled at everything because I had already been taught by some of the best in the industry just by calling up and saying, hey, I want to intern for you. Can you teach me what you're doing? And I recommend that a lot for people. Um, you know, if you're, if you're looking to get into a career or something like that, it doesn't hurt to reach out to the institution and say, are you guys accepting interns? Can I intern and learn what you're doing? Because, you know, most DJs are lazy. Let's just put it simple. And everything is so technological easy now. Everything's in a computer. But back in the day, we had to pull our music. We had to pull the music every hour, pull the commercials, and now that's all easy. So back in the day, interns were awesome for me because I felt bad having them do that. But that was something that an intern could learn because as radio used to go, you would always pull the first two hours of the guy coming in on the shift after you. And nowadays, like I said, it's all in computers. So you just walk in the building, sit down in your air chair, and away you go. And I, I'm just happy that I got to experience what I call real radio because everything is so sanitized now. Everything is so different. And a lot of times you can't even have a personality. That's why podcasts are so much more fun because I'm seeing people be real and have fun doing it. I mean, what's the purpose in doing it if you're not having fun? You're smiling. I see you smiling. You've got to be having fun doing this. Otherwise, you wouldn't be doing it, right? Oh, yeah. I totally agree. It's one of those things where each interview I do, I love learning about people. And something that you said is I kind of, it's always a conversation where it's book smart or street smart. And 
getting that real world experience because textbooks can tell you something, but they're not going to get you prepared for what you're actually doing. Like the jobs I do, a textbook would not tell me how to do my job right now. I kind of had to learn from people who've been doing this for a long time and I'm developing the skills over each day that I'm here. And I prefer that more than being in school. So when I was taking the opportunity to do internships, I would sign me up for those because that's the best experience is getting out there and trying it. Because then you kind of learn, are, do you like this? Do you enjoy doing this? And then if you have to make a change, you make the change. It's not like exactly. someone's telling you, you have to stick with this for the rest of your life. Right, and life is too short. You know, I, I was crazy back in the 90s. I, I worked in radio. I worked for a couple of TV shows. I worked for a TV station. And I worked for a music publication. I worked in all forms of the media at the same time. And people looked at me going, how do you even sleep? It's like, <laughs> I did, didn't even need to because there, I was living off of that raw energy and all of that passion. And I was in my 20s. So I was like, bring it on. I'm ready for this. And, you know, I wasn't a millionaire. I never made the kind of money that most people would think because you're doing all of that. But I had, pa these were passion projects. The TV shows were passion projects. Radio didn't fill the bank account. TV did to some degree. And the magazine was all passion for me because you don't realize the, fr the fringe benefits you get from these things. You know, there's people who would spend thousands of dollars to get a backstage pass to go meet their favorite band. Oh. Uh, once every couple weeks, I'm backstage interviewing bands for a publication or I'm on the phone with them taping an interview you know, back then we didn't have video interviews like this, except you go on their tour bus with a big VHS camera. And I've got tons of tapes like that, which is so cool because, you know, I, I've had so much fun doing it. And the craziest thing, God bless his soul, um, the, the lead singer from Quiet Riot, Kevin Dubrow. I remember when they first started out in the 80s, the guy had a receding hairline and hardly any hair. And in the 90s, when they were touring and I was on their tour bus interviewing, the guy had this huge beautiful mane of hair and I'm playing with his hair and I'm in between all the guys on the tour bus and I'm just playing with his hair and going is this like real what did you do because I don't remember you ever having hair like this of course I didn't know that they did hair plugs and hair transplants but I gave him so much grief over that hair and he took it so well and we had a good time and those are the kinds of things that you never look at till you get older and then you go, my God, I really did a lot of cool things in my life. No, I didn't make bank and no TMZ wasn't digging through my trash or back in those days, it was the National Enquirer. That's my joke. I tell everybody, they go, oh, you're famous. I'm like, no, I'm infamous. And second of all, if I were really famous, I'd have a bank account to match that and they'd be <laughs> going through my trash looking for all kinds of dirt on me. But you know, you you look at those experiences in life and you say, wow, you know, these are things that are incredible because I don't, I could have never afforded to buy experiences like this. So the, the trade-off being is doing the passion projects, loving what you do and experiencing things that most would never have the opportunity to. You're naming a lot of these bands and I think my family would be proud because I actually know the bands you're talking about for my <laughs> age because everyone's like, you were even alive or young. And I'm like, no, my dad grew up with me making me listen to these bands that you're talking yes, about. Yes, dad. I love your dad. I mean, he was playing Van Halen when I was like sitting in the chair. And I'm like, I, I appreciate that was music that you are, or the bands that you're talking about. Do you have a favorite interview that you did? Uh, my favorite interview. For, I would say my favorite interview of all time, and most people don't recognize the name of the band. It was a band from the 90s called Giant. And um, they had a hit song on MTV called I'll See You In My Dreams. And I think it was just how they were a bunch of really good guys. They were originally studio musicians. And Dan Huff, who is an amazing studio musician, he decided to form this band and they were big in their time, but I think just because they were so genuine, they were so genuine and just being on their tour bus, talking to them and probably one of the other fun ones was XYZ. And that's another band from the nineties that had a few hits, but uh, 
I still watch Terry, who was the singer on Facebook now, and he's so funny, but being on their little tiny bus, it was more like a small, tiny motor home. I gotta go break out all these videotapes now. I'm, I'm jonesing for this stuff, now to watch it. But I, just, just being able to be so close to them. And here's another one, MSG. I don't know if that one rings a bell. Michael Schenker and Robin McCauley. These are all bands from the, the 80s and 90s. And I think, you know, I haven't met too many of the newer bands. Um, here's something that um, is really close to my heart. I have not talked to him in many years, but he passed away a few years ago from suicide, Chester Bennington. I know you know that name, singer of Lincoln Park. He grew up here in Phoenix, and I first met him when he was a teenager, and he was singing for a band here. Um, he was doing some um, stuff at a, a local place called Long, or not Long Wings, um, Hollywood Alley. He was um, just singing in for a couple of bands, doing some spa punk. And then he went and joined this band, Gray Days. And meeting Chester back then, when he was a youngster, I could see some of the stuff that he had been going through. And we had had a couple of conversations. And, you know, it, break, it breaks my heart that he could never find that place to be 100% healthy because of everything he went through and the depression eventually beat him and that personal meeting with him and knowing him as a teenager before he became big that probably gets to my heart more than anything because he was he was really a gifted beautiful soul and I don't think he believed it and that's that to me was that means more to me than this whole entire career that I've been involved in but just getting to know him as a young man before he became successful meant a lot to me, you know? It's kind of hard for like, as fans listen and hear the stories to not really know the backstory about certain individuals. And it kind of shows that you kind of found that backstory about him and could see the progression, but it never, was able to get better in a way for him and he was legendary to so many people and he'll be with yes. for a long time you yeah. talked about being divorced at a young age did that kind of play an effect on what path you were taking um towards your career and for your personal life well let me go back to that because by that time i was in college i had been divorced twice and to be 23 and divorced twice is not a good place to be, but it was good for me because I married my son's father. I, I had a teenage pregnancy, so I had my son at 17 and I married his father not long after. And that was not a very healthy relationship for me. And I didn't understand when I first started going out with him as a younger girl, that this wasn't the right kind of relationship. It ended up becoming a very abusive relationship. And after losing my daughter, because I had a son by him first, and then I lost a daughter afterwards, it really taught me that I had to stand up and fight back for my life. And I did. I got away from him and got divorced. And then a few years later, I met someone else. And I thought, okay, this is going to be the right guy to become a dad to my son and, and be a positive role model. And when we married, he was okay. But nine months into that, out of nowhere, he flipped out. And I didn't know what was going on. I didn't understand it, but I didn't like what I was seeing. And he attacked my son, he attacked me, and I said, okay, I'm done. And years later, I found out that it was because he was bipolar and not taking medication. Had I known that at the time, maybe he could have gotten the help that he needed and maybe we could have gotten past a lot of things that happened, but that second marriage only lasted nine months. And, you know, the first one was three years. The second one was nine months. And here I was, a 23-year-old divorcee twice. And at that point, my son was six years old. I made a promise to myself. I said, you know what? You have to take everything you've been through and put that aside because this kid depends on you. My son had nobody else but me. Him and his father didn't have a relationship. His father exited the picture and didn't want anything to do with him. So. That was my driving force. No matter what I had to do, I knew that I could not stop because that kid needed me 
to be the productive family member. He needed me to be the strong person. And I don't care what was going on in my life. I dated a few people, but kept them away from my son. And I always got the same thing. Well, I want to marry you. I'm like, no, done. I don't want to do that again. I need to, uh, you know, my son comes first. It, it was the son first, career second, and any men in my life third. And that wasn't a popular thing to have in my life, of course, because guys didn't like being third. But they had to understand that they couldn't rescue me. I didn't need to be rescued. I had to do this on my own. And my son was my driving force. He is the reason why I was able to keep doing everything I was doing. I did all kinds of jobs you would never imagine. Uh, I worked in a steel foundry. I drove, I drove forklifts. I climbed 30 feet palm trees with spikes on my feet to trim palm fronds. I did whatever it whatever I could do. I never wanted to be one who went and got the easy job. And what I mean by that is I know, I don't have anything against anybody that, that does things, but I, for one, made myself a promise. I would never take off my clothes to earn money. I could never be a person to sell anything illegal that could harm somebody. I had to have my scruples in place. I wanted to be a good role model for my son. And, you know, the beautiful thing is, is I have a 35 year old son that, that to this day, we have an ultimately close relationship. We don't hang out very often, but when we do, it's like right back to where we were. And the coolest thing, he calls me his mad, his mom and dad. I'm so much more like a dad to him than I am a mom because we do dad and son things. We race cars. We go shooting. I mean, we do things that you would, you would look at and go, why are you doing that with, with the boy? How come there's not another guy doing it? I, dude, I love to drag race. I love to work on cars. I love to do those kind of things. And it just became natural to me to be more like the dad than the mom. And yes, I'm very much a female, as everybody can see, but I have those tendencies to act more like a guy than I do a woman. So I was driven to just keep moving, moving, moving. You know, like Dory says, just keep swimming. I couldn't give up. I, I couldn't. There was nowhere, nowhere for me to fail. And every time I fail, I just took that as another learning lesson because I had to keep going. What, what was I going to do? Fall down and then just watch this kid, watch his life fall apart because of me? I couldn't do that. I had to give him stability and I could have done more things with my career had I thrown my life in a box and moved around the world, but I chose to stay where I grew up because I wanted to provide roots for my son, and I didn't want to be that person who was selfish with my career. You know, that kid went backstage. That kid went on movie sets. He's done a lot of things. He builds movie cars now, but he tells me all the time now, you know, I wish you hadn't taken me on that movie set, mom. I'm like, well, you should have told me years ago. But, you know, then I see him doing music videos and building movie cars. It's like, well, uh, well, what's your excuse now? So, you know, that's the bottom line is he saved my life because even having him at 17 and not really knowing how to be a parent, I didn't have the best role models. I, my parents weren't really there for me. So I was just going along. I was trying to find the right way to do things. And no, I'm not perfect. You know, he's, he's not perfect either. None of us are. But I think given the, cir the circumstances, I think I did a pretty damn good job because he turned out to be a really good guy with a good heart. And that's, that's where we see how we do a good job as parents when it's reflected in our children. And he'll make mistakes and he'll, the first thing he'll do is he'll call me and he'll say, mom, you know, what about this? And I'm going, well, you know, like, why are you asking me? You already know the answer to this. And then, you know, it's like, I'm telling him. And then he's like, yeah, you're right. And he goes, I, I'm doing that anyway. I'm like, why do you even need me to, to agree with you or tell you what to do? You already know what to do. And that's how we learn is by seeing what our children grow up to be. And let me tell you something, he makes more money than I am. He's a lot more successful than I am in what he does. So the fact that you know, I, I've had people tell me all the time that kids should be raised in a two-parent household. 
that would have been nice. That would have been great. But not all parents are good parents when it's a negative situation. And, and by his dad not being in his life, we broke the cycle of abuse, which now my son is not an abuser. And he's an amazing, loving, giving soul with two kids of his own. So that to me is what attributes my success is knowing that he was why I kept doing what I was doing. No matter what, I couldn't quit. Did you always have that open communication with him at a young age where he was able to ask you questions and like you would be able to be open with him and answer them for him? Oh, absolutely. And I don't know how graphic we can get on this show, but <laughs> no, you, I'll tell there's you. No, there's no, we can talk about anything. We don't. I, I laugh about this because sometimes people will ask me that question and I'll tell them, yeah, I said, even to the point where I had this conversation, not so much the birds and the bees, because uh, nobody's going to care about that anymore. Kids learn all this stuff way before we even have that talk. But there were um, things that I knew uh, about my son. I could just tell because, you know, I'm, I see. And I would tell him, I'm going, you know what? Let me tell you, son. I got pregnant both times when I was on birth control. So I was taking that into my own hands, but it obviously didn't work. So I used to tell him, look, I'm not going to tell you not to go out and have sex with girls because that's going to be stupid for me to even think that you're not doing it. Cause I know better than that. You're a guy. I know girls are pretty. I know it happens. I just told him, I said, look, you and your sister, I got pregnant with you both on birth control. So I don't care what a girl tells you if she's on it or not, you have to take it into your own hands and be a good boy and protect yourself. And I said to him, I said, if you need me to buy them for you, I will. And the final part of it, I said, I had you at 17. You're almost an adult now. I've done my time. So no getting girls pregnant because mama's not going to sit home and babysit for you while you go out and party. And he did me proud. He didn't even have kids till his late twenties. So I'm like, yes, <laughs> you know, just, just by being honest by being honest, because if you're telling your kids not to have sex, they're not going to listen to you. It's, it's natural. We've all been there. I made those mistakes with my first boyfriend who became my first husband. You know, I lost my virginity at 16. I didn't know what I was doing. Do any of us know what we're doing? No, but the honest, open form of communication with your children is such a beautiful thing. And I know a lot of parents try to be friends first, but you have to be friends to a certain level, but you also have to be a disciplinarian because by nature, most of us as children, we want our parents to take an active involvement in raising us. We don't want to be sitting on the sidelines being ignored by our parents. We do want discipline sometimes because why would we act out and do stupid stuff if we didn't? We're testing you to make sure you still love us. We're testing you to get your attention because we feel like we're being ignored. I mean, I wasn't... I did stupid things when I was a teenager. I snuck out of my bedroom window, but here's what I did. I walked up to what we call Main Street, which is like three miles from my house. And on Wednesday nights at seven o'clock, everybody would get in their vehicles and cruise up and down Main Street and play music and just talk. We just all hung out. And this was years ago, back in the eighties. The it was a blast. We had, you know, I would sit in the back of my friend's truck. His girlfriend would sit back there with me he'd blare the music in the cab of the truck and have the window open so we could hear the music. And we'd be uh, driving up and down the street doing nothing, but just hanging out. And, you know, we forget that kids need to have some level of freedom. I feel bad for a lot of them now because of social media and being trapped into that whole thing. And I see so many kids get bullied back in our day. We just take it out to the playground. One knock, you're down, you're done. It's over with you. Shake hands, your friends. And now poor kids today, I mean, they deal with so much bullying on social media. But you now if any younger generation watches this, understand something, your self-worth doesn't come from everybody else. You are an amazing human being and you need to remember that self-worth comes from you. It doesn't matter how many likes you get. It doesn't matter what you post on social media. Love yourself and forget about worrying about being accepted by everybody as long as you accept yourself and who you are, that's the most important thing. And it took me a long time to get to that point, but you know, it's experience, it's life. And that's the biggest thing I think is 
people tend to forget that life is meant to be lived, you're not meant to be unhappy. You're meant to live a good, happy life. You just have to find the ways of doing that. The simplest little tiny things. For me, I, I take my convertible and go for drives. I get out. The other day I spent three hours walking in nature just taking pictures of birds. Yeah, it was awesome because the temperature cooled off. I froze a little bit. I sweat a little bit. I put my top down on my car and I just drove. It was fun. It, was, it didn't cost me anything but my time. And that's what we forget sometimes that we get so caught up in the day-to-day -day stuff that we forget to take a little time out for ourselves. Even if it's five minutes, just walk outside and enjoy the fresh air. Right? Yep. I totally agree. You talked about not describing yourself as the word victim, but how you can overcome that word. How are you able to overcome that? And what are you doing each day to keep yourself motivated to keep going in a positive direction? Victim mentality can destroy anybody. Um, I've gone through so much and what I tell everybody, you know, I've had domestic violence. I've lost a child, like I said. Um, I've dealt with bullying. I've dealt with, you know, discrimination on the job. I've dealt with so many things that I can't even believe when I go back and read what I've written in books that I've been there. That, that I'm like, wow, that doesn't even, I don't even remember that girl. And here's how I learned to get past the victim mentality. When you become someone who deals with so much death, it teaches you all about life. And I started having my close knit circle from the ages of 22 to 33. So you're talking, or 21 to 33, like 11 years, I lost 41 people. So I was going to anywhere from five to seven funerals a year for like 11 years. And it was teaching me more about myself because you learn that every day matters because at any given moment, something could happen to you. I had people die of cancer. My best friend died at 30 of cancer. I had friends die in car accidents. I had friends die from suicide, one of my other best friends died from a suicide at 29. You know, I had all these things happen to me and I just kept thinking, why is this happening? I don't understand why this is happening. And I had a friend point it out to me. He said, their life is already predetermined. Their death is predetermined. You're in their life to learn from their death. And within that short amount of time, after he said that, I met the love of my life. I married him after seven months. He had cancer and he died. We were only married seven months when he died. And when you stand before, if death never taught me anything before then, standing before him and giving him permission to die because the cancer just took him over too much and there was no way he was going to survive it. When you stand over somebody that you absolutely love and you give them permission to die, it teaches you that you have no right to sit back and cry victim. All of the death that I saw from a very young age taught me that, okay, I have to live life to its fullest for each and every one of those people. It was like, I called myself a soul catcher because I felt like a piece of every one of them was with me all throughout those years of losing them. And I kept saying to myself selfishly, if I can do anything to help somebody else, I'm going to. I am not going to allow myself to have my past dictate my future. I am going to take everything that's happened and throw those things underneath of me like stepping stones and use everything I've been through. Take the darkest parts of my life and turn them into rays of sunlight, not for just me, but for other people because Life is meant to be lived. Our journey is very short. Some of us may live 100 years. Some of us may live 20 years. And there's everything in between. But the idea that so many people sit back and go, why me? Why me? It bothers me. I don't like people who do that because you don't have to stay there. I'm living proof of that. I'm not perfect. I've made a mountain of mistakes. I got married way too young, twice. I've made a boatload 
of mistakes. But I've learned that those mistakes make me the better version of me. And every time something happens, even now when I make a mistake, I will own up to it. And I will look at myself in the mirror and say, you know what? You're human. Just understand that you're not perfect and it's okay. And the hardest part, I think, you know, where we get to in life is we forget that we have to love ourselves. That is a huge challenge. And we think we have to live up to everybody's expectations. But expectations are just that, and they will lead to disappointment. So why spend your time trying to live up to something that someone else holds you to when they're not even able to live up to what they need to? I look in that mirror when I'm feeling down and I'll say, okay, you are an amazing human being. You're human, you go through things, but you learn from everything you've been through and today is gonna be a good day. No matter what, you're gonna smile, you're gonna go out there and you're gonna make someone else smile, you're gonna make someone laugh. That's my credo. I make at least one person laugh or smile every day. If I don't, I'm not doing my job. And I kick myself in the butt for doing that. But I just keep going every day because I know I have no other choice. I don't sit back in a victim mentality because my life doesn't allow me to. And I write things every day. I will push myself to put out something that's positive. And I, I don't beat up on myself, but I think a lot of people will see that as the way that I do it. I will open myself and be vulnerable because I think that's our greatest strength when we can be vulnerable and peel back the layers and say, hey, you know, I'm not perfect. I'm human. I've done this. I've taken responsibility for it. And this is how I get through things. And just realize that, yeah, you're going to have crappy days. It's not going to be 100% perfect and positive, but you just have to push yourself every day. And it starts as simple as just looking at the mirror and smiling at yourself. I know looking at yourself sounds so vain and all that other stuff, but I'm not narcissistic. I, I absolutely, I mean, when I knew your show was video, I'm like, oh my God, I'm a radio guy. I don't do video, but you know, I, I do what I got to do. And you invited me on and I, I appreciate that you have the kind of platform like this because it helps people understand that they're not alone, that we can all rise to the challenge of being the better versions of ourselves. And my biggest thing is just every day, I want to keep putting positivity out there. And I don't want to spread negativity because there's enough of that out there. But I want other people to understand that no matter how crappy life can seem at this moment, Tomorrow is another day and it can be better. Just get through one moment and, and, you know, every minute of every second of every day, just get through it and breathe. Don't worry so much about the future. You can't change the past. We've already been there. I mean, there's that saying, you know, the, the past is already gone. The present is the gift. And that's where we have to get our mindset to is just making it through every minute of every day and not worrying about what ifs. I can't change what's going to happen in the future. All I can do is change what's going to happen in the next 60 seconds and eventually just shut up and give it back to you so you can talk. Cause I, you know, radio people don't know when to shut up. You know, you're just... good. You're good. I think <laughs> one of those things where I've learned about myself is I always think way ahead in the future. And when you start thinking way ahead in the future, you start thinking about negative things that are happening, things that may not even happen. And then you start panicking and then you're like, Alex, it has, you haven't even gotten to the next day. Yet. You don't know what path you're going to take. You have to take it one step at a time. And a lot of times we talked about social media and people have the expectation on what are they supposed to look like? What are they supposed to act like? Oh, this person act like this and they're getting all these likes and stuff. I need to act like this. I've kind of uh. learned that. I'm my own person. People are gonna respect me how I am, how I look, and if they don't like that, I don't need to be associated with them. I want to be around people that like me for who I am as a person and the characteristics I show. And I think I've been given a strong group of people that have that similar mindset. And with this show, we're not telling people how to live their life. We're, like you said, we're people that we've all have gone through a challenge or a journey, and we're here to share it and maybe inspire someone to be able to 
reach out to us and just have a conversation because like you said, we can make that person smile or happier their day even better. That's what we hope for. We're not negative people. We, I know you and I, we don't bring out the negativity in people. We want to keep the positive going for all types of people. Uh, definitely, because if you look at the state of the world right now, it's not, we're in such a divisive era where, you know, people are on one side or the other. And that's the one thing I, I have people, I have good friends on both sides. And I tell everybody, look, there's two things I never talk about because I love people for who they are. Every one of us has our own opinion. Everyone has our own ability to be who we are. But I will never talk about politics and religion because there is such a divide when it comes to a lot of things that I don't want to add to that. And, you know, I was given a compliment yesterday that actually brought tears to my eyes because this was from an old friend of mine that used to work in the sports department. He's now heading a sports department in Colorado. And I haven't seen him in years, but we used to like toss a football back and forth where I worked and we would talk hockey every time, you know, a game was played because I was a hockey writer. And he put a thing up on my Facebook post yesterday. And he said, you know, we don't talk much anymore, but I need to tell you that you have, you're one of the most bright, bright, brightest spots on social media. And um, I mean, I can't even get the words out because it just, sometimes we don't know if what we're saying makes a difference. I have people that I know that work in the area of motivational speaking and coaching and stuff. And a lot of times we feel like it's a dead end. We don't know if what we're saying or doing is helping. But then you get comments like that once in a while that will make me tear up and make me realize that, okay, even if I don't hear things from people, there are people on the sidelines that are watching and they're, they're understanding that we're trying to add something better to the world. I'm trying to be more light than I am dark. I don't want to add more negativity when there's already enough negativity because people, they don't deserve that. And, you know, I have another friend who was texting me last week because he put a Sharpie on his ballot and Sharpie gate happened and everybody thought their, their vote wasn't going to count. And he, he says to me, he goes, I'm so depressed. And I'm like, why? What's going on? I thought it was something happening in his life. And he goes, no, it's my vote. My vote's not counted. I spent 20 minutes trying to reassure him as a journalist that I know that they do count. But I saw what a tailspin that sent him in. And I'm just like, my God, we human beings are so susceptible to everything in our environment. And we have to learn to block that out. We have to somehow just block that out. And he actually deactivated his Facebook for three days and then contacted me today. And he said it was the best thing he ever did. So he went on, checked something and then got back off of it again. Because we don't realize how sensitive our energy can be to that negative impact from all around us. And there's enough of it. I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be that person putting that out there. I would rather not post anything. And as a person that does blogging on all of my social, I mean, I'm, I'm everywhere. So I have to try to do something every day to add to the positive. And even if I just throw a, a positive meme up with the word truth exclamation point after it, that's what I will do. If I don't feel like writing anything, then I'll just find that good meme and put it out there because I want to add positivity and light to the darkness because I've been in the darkness and it's not fun. It's not fun to be there. It's not fun to always question why do these things happen to me? And I've learned that it's not things happening to us. It's things happening for us. We have to take what happens because it's, 10% what happens and 90% how we react and what we do after the fact. If we take everything we go through and we learn how to, you know, cultivate our lives to be better from that experience, not only are we learning ourselves, but we're teaching other people around us that we're capable as human beings to do anything we put our mind to. We don't even use much of our brain and our brain is an extremely powerful tool Something as simple as looking in the mirror and saying a positive thing to yourself will have 
an amazing reaction all day long, all day. And when I'm driving in traffic, I mean, I'm, I don't know how you deal with traffic sometimes, but traffic out here can get really bad. And I'm blasting my stereo in my car. And if somebody pisses me off, I'm not going to stick my hand out the window and, and yell at them. I am going to blast the music and I'm going to say a few choice words under my breath in my car because I'm expending that negative energy out. I don't want to cause them any issues. I don't want to have anybody come after me because I was mean and nasty, but I don't want to carry that for the rest of my day either. I don't know what they're going through. They might be having a bad day too. So instead of reacting to their action, I'm just going to say a few choice words under my breath and mosey on my way and not let it affect me. And I know that sounds so stupid, but just think about it this way. If you stick your middle finger at them, and if they're not in a good mood and they might have a bad attitude, they might come back and do something against you. And then it's two negatives. Something as simple as just, you know, letting it go and not letting the bad stuff affect you. It's, it's a lot easier than we even realize. But the human side of us wants to always, well, I'm better than that. I'm right, you're wrong. It's like, you know what, who cares? Life is too damn short. And like I told you earlier, death has been my greatest teacher. It has taught me that none of us are invincible. I used to think I was climbing them 30 foot palm trees in my twenties, but to look at them now, I'm like, what was I thinking? You know, I had to earn a living. What was I thinking? There's no way I would do that now. Uh uh, no way. Not in my right mind would I climb a 30 foot palm tree today. Uh uh. <laughs> Unless if I was falling into water, maybe, but not, not if it's on land with the sands right underneath me. Because no, I mean, I mean, you'll just fall right down. But if there was water, then I would probably climb it. Yeah, I mean, you see, we see the videos of people doing stuff like that. <sighs> really? Why? Hey. I'm an adrenaline junkie. I will drag race, but you know, I'm going to be cautious about it. And I, I take care of my car now. She's a little too, you know, she's got almost 200,000 miles. So I got to baby my Mustang now. I'm not going to take her down the quarter mile anymore, but just the idea that my 45th birthday, me and my son went drag racing. That's how we celebrated my birthday, you know, and I beat him, which was kind of cool. <laughs> it was fun. I will not lie. Him. Just like, how, I beat you. I, I don't even, nah, my mom would never do anything. She doesn't even, I mean, I, we joke, like, she can't even do Mario Kart right. Like, she just crashes uh, into the wall. And so, like, I couldn't even think of her doing, like, go-karts and drag racing. But it would actually, I would probably pay to see that. Just to see I, the action and everything. Well, we have this rivalry. It's like, it's like I said, it's like son and, and father. And it's funny because back in the day when we were playing video games when he was younger, our game was Mortal Kombat. Oh. He used to get so mad at me because I knew my weapons. <laughs> I knew how to discharge. And, and he would always pick different players. And I, I'm always, I picked my player and I learned that player. It's like, yeah. son, don't change your players. Learn how to do the weapon. Mom, you're cheating. You're using your weapons. I'm like, oh, dude, I'm not cheating. That's just I, learned, I, I learned, you know, I know how to throw the swords. I know how to do the backflip kick. And, he <laughs> play, and he's changing every one of his players every game. I'm like, pick a player and learn it. And he, he even went out and got the book on the cheaters codes. I'm like, dude, come on. <laughs> Who was that character that you were using? Um, I used Sonya in the first one and then Katana in the second one. Okay, yeah. So there in the very first Mortal Kombat was Sonya and she would always have that little back flip where she would grab you and throw you and then Katana would throw her little swords. So I I mean, it's crazy for me to even think that, but now at times you know, I, I have this nice big 50 inch TV in here and I keep thinking, I need to go get me a game console and play some Mortal Kombat because I miss it. I mean, funny that I would even think that at my age that I want to get into it but then again a lot of my guy friends that are that age still play all kinds of things for <laughs> duty and all the other stuff that's out there but I mean I I don't want to get lost in it but I used to kick his butt so bad in Mortal Kombat and I thought I thought on the drag strip he would beat me but of course he had a Pontiac Firebird and I have a Mustang GT so you know the odds are going to be that I was going to beat him <laughs> So what does the future look like for you professionally and personally? What are you hoping to accomplish in the next few years? Ah, oh, well, um, I'm hoping to put out another book 
I just put out my second one in March of this year. So I'm hoping to get my butt busy and start working on another book or two, just because it, I have all of these stories that are still there that need to come out. And the weird thing about me is I write about real life. I've never written a book that's fantasy or, you know, fiction based type thing. It's always real life stuff. So maybe I'll try my hand at doing something like that to see if I can generate characters in the head and not so much all this real life stuff that's happened. And, um, you know, I host a podcast myself. So I'm just hoping by doing, I don't put out that many episodes. I do it a couple times a month only because I want to make sure that it's something that has validity to it. I produce podcasts every week. So I'm doing weekly shows for other people. And for my show, I like to tackle subject matters that people don't want to talk about, but they need to hear. And that's the beautiful thing. I find people, and I'm friends with some of these people, they're my mentors, that they're willing to talk about things that most people don't talk about because they're afraid to. People don't want to talk about the bad things in their life. But if we can get to a point where it's okay to talk about these bad things and you're not just doing it in therapy, but you're actually able to voice it out loud, you never realize how much that's going to help you grow as a person, but you never realize who you're going to help because your story could be someone else's instruction manual. What you went through, you could help someone else get through the tough parts in their life. So I'm hoping that in the next few years that I can find more people to come on that are willing to talk about it because we get real. There, there's no censorship on that show. You can say whatever you want. You can talk about anything. Again, I always avoid certain things like politics and religion because to me, they're subjects that don't belong in my wheelhouse. I try to deal with you know, trauma survivors, people who have gone through things that just want to make a difference in the world and that want to not only heal themselves, but heal others. And I'm hoping that I can find some more people in this world in the next few years that are willing to come on and just be raw and be bold and just put it out there because there's a lot of good people in this world. Even with all the bad things that have been happening, there's a lot of amazing, tremendously gifted, beautiful souls in this world. They just don't know how to use their voice. And I'm just hoping that I find more of those people. So between that and writing the books and maybe doing a little bit more traveling in the car and getting to more than just the, the you know, the few states I've been to get around and do some crazy stuff. I like zip lining. So maybe I'll go find some really cool zip line places to go and that kind of stuff. I just want to keep enjoying life. I want to keep living life to its fullest. And whatever I can do to help somebody continue planting the seeds so that, you know, I'm not, I don't want to be, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? I just want to help. I want to do something with my life that makes a difference. I don't want to just sit around and do nothing. So I'm just hoping in the next few years that meeting more and more people, doing more and more good things and just spreading the love because what else is there? Love, love is the one thing we take with us when we leave this earth. So I just want to keep spreading the love and keep doing things and being positive. For someone that's listening to this interview, based on your journey and experience, what tips or advice would you give them to overcome their obstacles, accomplish their goals, and rise to the challenge? The most important thing that I can tell anybody is breathe. Just breathe. Stop yourself in the moment. We've all experienced anxiety and being overwhelmed by things in our life. The biggest thing you can do is stop yourself for a moment, take a breath, relax, don't react. Because a lot of times when we react, that's where the issues happen. And we might say or do something that we later regret. But you have to stop yourself for a moment and say, okay, calm down. You've got this. It doesn't matter what anyone else thinks. You're in control. Even when we don't feel like we're in control, we're more in control than we even realize. Yes, things are going to continue to happen that may not be always a good thing, but you can learn from everything that happens. And, you know, there's situations that I've been through that haven't been the best situations for me, 
But when I look back now and I see that, I would not be who I am today if I hadn't gone through all of that stuff. That adversity taught me to be the stronger person. So whatever you're going through, it doesn't make you who you are. You can change the direction your life goes in no matter what. I have lost everything in my entire life at least a dozen times. I've had to start over so many times. And my rule in life is sometimes you have to lose everything to find yourself. Because when you get to that point, it's not necessarily rock bottom, but when you tend to lose all of the, the other stuff that's around, whether it's the money, the job, the, the materialistic items, all you have is yourself. You are your best commodity. And no matter how much you think the world is against you, it's really not. It's your mindset that's working against you because again, no matter what happens to you, it's up to you how you deal with it. I could tell you my whole life story and you would look at me and go, what? No way. You've heard some of the good things. You've heard a little bit of the bad, but there's been a lot of really tough things that I've endured, but I'm here to tell you, I, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. No one can give you your happiness, but you. No one gives you your self-worth, but you. You are in charge of that. And that's the most important thing I could ever tell anybody. You're not going to find your happiness in marrying somebody or dating somebody or with your friends. You can find your happiness being around certain people, but you've got to find that happiness inside. You have to take those times out for yourself. Solitude is an amazing gift. Being by yourself, learning about yourself, encouraging yourself, even when you think you have nobody in your life. What's funny is I'm a loner. I am very much a loner. I spend a lot of time alone. I don't hang out with a lot of people. And I find that is the most beautiful thing for introspection, realizing what you're capable of doing as a human being, because everything is energy that's around us. Everything inside of us is energy. How everything around us affects us if we let it. You don't have to let the outside world affect you. You can shut that off, take a walk outside, turn off social media, turn off the news, get away from the negativity, just breathe, relax, enjoy your life, find your true inner happiness, and don't expect. Don't have expectations because when you have expectations on people, that's your expectations and you're just going to be disappointed. You just have to accept everyone for who they are. And it's that simple. Don't have expectations and enjoy your life. Robin, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show and talking about your rise to the challenge. We all have learned so much about you in your journey and we're excited to see what the future looks like for you oh alex thank you so much i appreciate everything you're doing and i absolutely love what you're doing with this show and thank you for the opportunity <laughs>